so we're here in a field in Runnymede. In Surrey. <laughs> yeah, on a very cold morning. Yeah. Um, now I know that you've said that the, um, the Magna Carta could be represented as, and these are your words, an 800-year-old quarrel between an autocratic king who believed that he had the authority from God to rule exactly as he liked, and a set of his barons who represented no one but themselves and their own local and class interests. Why is this important given that some people might see it that way? Because this unlikely band of scoundrels accidentally uh, did a peace treaty between themselves which incorporated principles of how you should govern a country which became very important in England. And most people don't know much about Magna Carta. Most people have heard of it uh, and actually it has been cited over the years and still is sometimes as the basis of the free society here that uh, no man or woman can actually be deprived of their liberty without proper process of law is the key thing they laid down. I very much doubt whether the barons thought it would apply to people <laughs> like you and me but they thought it applied to them. <laughs> but over the years it, it was the beginning of English politics where people cited it in order to resist autocratic kings and, and today we have to be careful of the principles of Magna Carta because we have the modern all-embracing overpowerful modern executive. What do you think are the major challenges to those fundamental rights enshrined in the Magna Carta now? Uh, well the, the thing to make sure is we don't get so panicked by terrorism well, those are very real threat that we don't get so absolutely concerned about regulating the whole of our lives uh, we don't get too puritanical or patronizing about what how other people conduct their lives, that we start passing laws and regulation that deny people their essential liberty, particularly the important ones, which Magna Carta was talking about, which is the right to personal freedom and the right to keep your possessions. Some people in New Labour didn't seem to me to have an ounce of liberalism in, in, in their body. Uh, and we've already uh, got rid of this identity card scheme, which was being extended into a vast data collecting exercise on individual citizens. We're uh, setting up an inquiry about, uh, into allegations of uh, any British uh, complacent compliance with ill treatment of detainees in Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere. We're issuing guidance on how we think people uh, should behave in that field. We're reviewing all the anti-terrorism legislation with considerable care. Of course you have to protect the citizen in the dangerous modern world, but you have to protect the society which we're all defending and you have to make sure that you get the balance right. Another thing that's aroused a lot of concern lately is secrecy and the idea that there's a growing secrecy in the courts and that that again is, is violating that fundamental Magna Carta right of due process. Um, are you concerned about the increase in secrecy in, in a whole range of, of legal proceedings? Things like the confidentiality of the family law courts so that you don't just have journalists rushing in to get lurid stories about the quarrels over the children of celebrities, uh, I would actually defend. I mean, there is privacy, there is confidentiality. The individual subject is entitled not to have things which are of no wider public interest publicised. So, but other than that, obviously, I start with the principle, as we always have in this country, that justice is an open system and that any member of the public can wander into any court and listen to the proceedings and, and hear them. I'm thinking of the case of Al Rawi in particular, where the government recently oh. attempted to have a whole civil trial heard in secret for the first time. Oh, well, they're there again. We are going to have a look at that. We promise that we will actually produce a paper on this in the new year. Uh, no one can seriously pretend that you can just publicly discuss the day-to-day -day activities of the MI5 and MI6 and explain what they did and who their informants were and all this kind of thing. On the other hand, everybody's entitled to a proper process of law, proper protection of their individual liberty, not least above all to make sure that you're dealing with the right man whom you're accusing of being a terrorist or whatever it is. It, it is actually quite difficult because you, you can't just fool about and for the benefit of the wider public just uh, start discussing your intelligence services in public. You have to work out how on balance you can ensure justice is done the, lib the liberties of the individual are respected without compromising national security. It's quite complicated. Now we talked a lot about the rights in Article 39 of the Magna Carta, but there's also Article 40, which is to no one will we sell, to no one deny or delay right to justice. Now, are you concerned that the, the changes in legal aid as part of the um, cost-saving measures are going to make it harder for people to have access to justice and that actually you as a government will be giving away people's right to have access? We, we have complete uh, access to justice in this country for everyone. You 
uh, anyone's, uh, everybody's equal under the law, uh, everybody can have access to justice and there are very key things where in the public interest we ensure that those people who can't afford it actually have representation and advice to look after their interests. But uh, we have got a litigious society. We have got vast numbers of lawyers. We spend more on legal aid than any other modern state in the world would regard as remotely sensible. And we are in the middle of a financial crisis. So when we produce our green paper proposals, I think you'll find we, we address the basic principles. But we do get back to a bit of common sense about exactly how far we should be spending the taxpayers' money on litigation.